I'm a neuroscientist, and I had a past career in breaking into computers, which is somewhat similar but has some differences. And uh, in my work, I use both. I'm going to talk to you today about my current work. And if you ask me afterwards, I'll mention a little bit of what I find that combines those two. So in the past couple of years, I've been studying the brain. And I'm trying to do that in order to understand behavior. I want to understand why we do what we do, and if there is some way that we can predict behavior, if I can know what you're going to do in the future. And first, I need to convince you that the brain is what governs our behavior. So I'll tell you a little simple story. This guy here, his name is Charles Whitman. In 1966, this guy goes to the University of Texas in uh, um, Houston, climbs the top tower university, takes an AK-47, and starts spraying people, killing 30 right away. Well, he waits for the paramedics to show up, and then he shoots them. He waits for the police, he shoots them. Ultimately, he kills 13 people and injures 65 before killing himself. When the police tries to investigate this incident, figure out what happened, why he did that, it turns out that all his neighbors say that he's a sweet guy, a Boy Scout type of man, and no one has any clue why he would do that. So they go to his apartment, and they start searching around, and they find his diary. And in his diary, he writes a description of his behavior, and he says, something is changing about me. I feel like I'm not the same. I become a different person. I don't know what's going on with me, but I feel that I need to be checked. And if something ever happens to me, I leave here a check, $3,000, and I ask you to do an autopsy on my brain because something is not right. So the police does that. And they find out that he has a brain tumor on the left side of his brain, on the frontal lobe, that presumably has to do with decision making, making him behave in a way that's not typical. So is he at fault or not? This person is a normal behavior that turned into a wicked man from, due to some kind of problem in his brain. I argue that our brain is what governs our behavior, and changes in our brain change to change, lead to changes in our behavior. We all know that from little things like that. I had to go to sleep very late last night preparing this talk, and I wanted to wake up at 6.30 to make sure everything is in place. So I put an alarm, I set the alarm to 6.50, 6.30, sorry, and I woke up, and it was pretty tiring, so I pressed the snooze button, and after five minutes I woke up again, pressing the snooze button, again for five minutes. And I asked myself then, why is there a snooze button? Why is there a snooze button? I myself set the alarm to 6.30, knowing I want to wake up. Why did I have to create a machine that helps me not wake up, but somehow trick myself? It's my brain that decided. Why is my brain fighting me? Why are there clocks like this one who try to escape you so you can actually wake up knowing that you are the one who set them? Why are there clocks like this one who actually increase their volume over time because you really don't want to wake up? Or clocks like this one actually make it become a helicopter and you have to chase it in the room to put it to sleep? Or like this one that you actually have to dismantle within 10 minutes, <laughs> otherwise it explodes. Why do we have those clocks? Why is it that our brain, which is ours, is actually fighting us? I always think about it when I go to buy toothpaste. I go there and I see a variety of them and they have different colors and different fonts, and I know that they're made to make me choose this or that one, and they have different pricing, and I want to know what is it that I really want? Which one do I like? But I never know. I try to ignore all the things there and see which is the one that I like, which is my preferable taste. Do I even like Coca-Cola, or is it something that just is ingrained in me? What is a taste? In a study that was done at NYU, a few years ago, taste was being measured directly. So people were basically coming to the lab, and they were seeing either those two pictures, if they're straight male, they would see those two pictures of female, if they were straight female, they would see this picture of male, and they were asked to decide which one of the two they find more attractive. Let's take these two women and choose for yourself which one do you like more, the one on the left or the one on the right? They see those pictures, and the experiment goes like that. They have those two pictures in front of their eyes. They say, mm, doctor, I like the one on the left. And then they get handed the card with this picture, and they have to explain in one sentence why they picked this woman. So they say the one on the left, they get the card, they say, I like her earrings. They put it on the side, and then they see another pair of two pictures. And they say, this time it's the one on the right. They get the card, and they say, mm, I like her hairstyle. And they put it, and they go on and on. But it turns out there's a trick here. In about 10% of the trials, the person who was handing you the card was actually a magician, and he gave you the other card. So you chose the one on the left, but he handed you the one on the right. People rarely noticed. They got the card they didn't choose, 
and they actually look at it, and not only they, they pick it up without saying it's not the one I chose, they actually explain why they chose this one. They pick the one on the left, they get the one on the right, and they say, hmm, I really like her smile. They didn't pick her. So what is it about our brain that always tries to explain what we get rather than do what we choose? Here's a simple example. I'm going to show you here a little movie. Repeated pattern of pictures, one after the other. Quickly, we'll see a picture of Yossi there wearing a hat. It's very easy to recognize. Now I want you to clap your hands before his picture appears, before you see him, when you see a picture that comes before that. Quickly, your brain learned this, uh, this pattern. You somehow saw this sequence, and you figured out that the picture of Maria Teresa comes before. What happened in your brain? You somehow memorized a short sequence, you realized what comes next, and you created predictions about the future. All of that happened in your brain without any effort. It just happened by itself. Well, our brain apparently is a machine that is really good in making predictions. Actually, it's good in telling stories. I'm going to show you a simple, quick movie now. This movie has three shapes running around. Try to see if you can figure out what's the story in this particular movie. We have one circle running around, chased by a square, being helped by another square, and then they run around, go inside, lock the door. The big square breaks in, fights with one of them, and then the two of them escape the room, lock the door behind them, while the big bully tries to break the door. It's just three squares and circles running around. But somehow our brains create a story. This is a boy and a girl. Who's the boy, by the way? The square. The girl is the circle. There's another bully fighting them. He's there fighting for the girl. All of this story was created in our mind because we try to create patterns from things like that. This is what our brain is good for, making stories from little discrete events in our life. It's also good for creating patterns from things we see. Here's a picture from from the, from the crater in the moon. What do you see here? You see a face, right? Your brain somehow dis distinguishes the face right away. Here's another face in two ice cubes. Here's another face in a rope and two mirrors. Here's another face in three birds. Our brain somehow sees those patterns and right away identifies those things because our brain is made to identify patterns and make them in give them meaning. Here's a famous one of a Virgin Mary on a toast, or even more famous one, the picture of Satan in the smoke coming out of the Twin Towers in New York. Here's my favorite current one, it's Kermit the Frog on the shape of Mars from the Mars over. We always see those patterns right away. And the thing is that we think that we are very unique. We think that our brain is very special. We, are, we have a personality, we have a psychology, we are very, very unique. But somehow, when we are exposed to those pa patterns, we all end up seeing the same things. It's like my grandfather used to tell us, you are very unique just like everyone else. The thing about the brain is that if you want to study the patterns and behavior, if you want to understand how it works, you have to look inside. You have to actually look at individual brain cells and see how they talk to each other, because this is where the pattern is encoded in the brain, in little cells that are very hard to access from outside. This is done often with rats and mice. Scientists actually open their brain and put electrodes inside. But can they do it with humans? It turns out that you can. What I've been doing in the last couple of years is working with patients who are undergoing brain surgery for clinical purposes, and we actually put electrodes inside their brains, in their open brain, trying to look inside and identify those patterns. So these people have some kind of part of their brain which is faulty. If you look in the brain, you see something like that. You see brain cells, and you see deep inside neurons, and they speak to each other in electric pulses. This is how the brain talks to each other. And we can actually look at that with those little electrodes when we find patients that have epilepsy. And in epilepsy, a part of your brain is somehow faulty. It starts talking by itself spontaneously with no apparent reason in like an earthquake in your brain. So you walk around naturally, and suddenly you fall and you collapse because your brain starts kind of getting active by itself. Usually those patients can be treated with medications. Most people can have good medications and they live perfectly with no seizures. But some people don't respond well to medications. And these people actually require this invasive surgery, where we try to put electrodes in their brain and find out a way to know which part of their brain is faulty. We open their brain slowly, creating a cranium in our brain, putting electrodes deep inside, and then we keep them in the hospital bed, awake, for about two weeks with the wires inside their brain while we're monitoring them 24-7, trying to see which part becomes active spontaneously before they have a seizure. So we can tell what part of the brain is the part that actually creates a seizure. And then ultimately, when we see this part again and again, take the wires out and remove the faulty part of the brain, rendering them seizure-free. This is how it looks. You take it out slowly, you close everything, you remove the wires, and these patients are now fixed. They don't have epilepsy anymore. 
This is the clinical part. But what I do is I piggyback on that very special case where you open someone's brain and put electrodes inside to actually study their brain. So I use this opportunity to look inside a brain and use those electrodes that are here to listen to the cells speaking to each other. And what can you learn from cells speaking to each other? Let's give an example. Here's one patient. This woman is sitting there in bed and watching short movies. What you're going to hear now is the activity of one individual cell in her brain while she's watching those clips. And I'm going to tell you that this cell actually cares a lot about something in her brain. Try to figure out for yourself what this particular cell in this woman's brain cares about. Welcome to Hollywood. Those Everybody clicks comes to Hollywood, is the cell. Dream. What's your dream? I have a dream that one day to Wall Street and the New York Stock Exchange, the world's largest and surprisingly one of the... Hey, Dad! Right on time. Get out of here. No. You Never heard large. it? Trust me. This is the cell becoming active, rapidly firing in the brain when this woman sees a movie of The Simpsons. Why? Because this is the cell in her brain that identifies The Simpsons. She has millions of those, and she has millions of others that identify other things. But every time she sees The Simpsons or thinks about The Simpsons, this cell fires. How do I know that, she does, she, that it doesn't fire for any other blue thing and only for The Simpson? Because I can go back to her afterwards and tell her, now forget about the movies. Just sit in bed and in your own free accord, try to recall which movies you've seen. And what you're going to see now is her just sitting in bed and trying to say things that she remembers having seen earlier. And when you see that when she remembers The Simpson, this cell fires. So we can actually see her memory in action. We'll hear the cell firing, and then a second later, she's going to say, oh, The Simpson. Here it is. We're hearing her thoughts before she even speaks them. When I speak to you right now, it seems to me that everything I say just comes out of my mouth as I think it. I don't really think about the words and then say them. They just come out. You hear them as much as I. But here we see that her thoughts about the Simpsons actually come out before she speaks them. So we can actually see thoughts in the brain before they occur outside. And this is remarkable because we can find many of those cells, one after the other. We can find a cell for the Simpson, a cell for Marilyn Monroe, a cell for Michael Jackson, a cell for her mother, her father, places she like, and we can actually map slowly thoughts in her brain. We find patterns of activity in her brain that we can interpret and see what she, think, what she thinks of. And then we can actually sit there and just look, look at her brain and see which patterns emerge in her brain and know what she's thinking of. And this is exactly what we did. We had her sit in bed, think of things, of a small number of things, of, of Marilyn Monroe, Michael Jackson. We see the patterns and we project the thoughts of what she thinks about on the screen. We projected her thoughts on a small number of things on a screen in front of her eyes. And this is remarkable, but it doesn't end here. With humans, we can project thoughts, but with animals, we can actually activate thoughts. So we can take animals, like this little mouse here, and connect electrodes to the part of the brain that controls his or her is moving left or right, and then we can activate his movement, make him move left or right with our choice. Here's how it looks. The mouse sits there. Someone presses a button and it moves left or right, like a robot. In theory, we can do it with humans too, but we never so far activated cells by ourselves. We just wait for them to go by themselves. But there's something we can do with humans. We can help people who lost the ability to communicate in some form or shape and help them reactivate their thoughts. We can take people like these two people. This woman here who had a car accident and lost the ability to move anything from her neck down or well, this man here was stabbed in the neck and again lost the ability to move anything from his neck down. For years and years, they wouldn't 
they weren't able to move anything. Their brain still functions. The part that sends signals to the, to the body saying, move left, move right, is still working. But somehow they cannot communicate this to the body because the connection doesn't work. But the brain still works, so we can connect something, device, to their brain and actually help them control things with their mind. This guy now plays Pong just by thinking of moving left and right in his brain. This woman, after 13 years of not being able to do anything, is now able to control a robotic arm, grasp a can of Coke, and bring it to her and drink it after 13 years with the aid of the machine, reading her activity. You can imagine how great she feels when she does it. This is a clinical trial that's being done by John Donahue in University of Brown, Brown University right now. And there's a few patients who are going through this, and they're able to read the patterns in their brain and activate machine using those patterns. I had to come to Munich yesterday, and I wanted to know what the weather like in Munich is. So I looked at weather.com, and I saw that it's uh, 34 degrees Fahrenheit, a little cold. I had to know that it's cold by creating a memory. I looked at the weather.com channel, and I said, OK, it's 34 degrees. What does it remind me of? It reminds me of the time I went to Paris. It was cold there as well. This is how I actually made myself think about the temperature. But you know, when I'm here, the part of my brain that actually passes temperature is somewhere there. There's somehow a part in my brain that knows what the temperature is. So what if I could connect this brain instead of a, a robotic arm, I connect it to a weather.com, and now when I actually want to feel the temperature, I will just click on Munich and feel for a second what 34 degrees Fahrenheit is. It's in my brain. I can do that. What if I go even farther in science fiction? I connect it to my stock portfolio. So every time my stocks go down, I feel pain. Or if they go up, I feel pleasure. It's all my brain. It's a machine. I can connect the two of them easily. I can have the world somehow manifest itself inside my brain. I'm going to finish by telling you about one experiment that kind of manifested this one particular thing, which is not just looking at the world and connecting to it, but actually connecting to the world from our unconscious. In a study that was done at UCLA, patients see a little clock. This is the clock. And the clock rotates and revolves very quickly. And they're asked, whenever they want, to press a button and stop the clock. So the clock rotates, and whenever they want to, they press a button and it stops. And that's it. They do it again. It revolves, they press a button, it stops, revolves, and so on. What we find there are cells in their brain that become active a little before they actually press the button. So we know in advance that they're about to press the button. But we know something else. We know that they're about to press the button so early that it's before they even felt the urge. So when they sit there, they somehow feel the urge to press the button, and they press it. But we know so early that we can actually tell that in a second, they would want to press the button in a second. So we know something that's going to happen far in the future. What can we do with that? We can actually predict their behavior much before they actually behave. Here's an example of that. Here is the Here's the trial, here's the clock, and you're gonna hear the cell before the movement happens. And it stops. Here's another example. A different cell in her brain. Yet active now, button press. So we know something before they actually do it, and before they even want to do it. So we know something from their unconscious, something from within their brain. This allows us to actually parse patterns of activity and know about behavior that's going to come in the future before the person who owns that know. Now, if you think that that's something special, I can tell you that I just went yesterday to the New York Times website, and I saw a, a place where you can actually play rock, paper, scissors against the computer. You just, in every trial, you choose rock, paper, scissors, and you play the computer, and you either win or lose. Turns out that the computer uses a very simple algorithm. It finds someone like you in the world, and it is able to win all the time. You can try it. You can go online and try to play. After three games, it finds someone like you, and it always wins. How come it wins? Because we're not that special. Somehow, there is a pattern of behavior that we can quickly pass, identify. So our brain is kind of like a crystal ball. We can look into it, and we can see something about the future. We can actually easily know which word is going to come in the end of this sentence, just by looking at my activity and predicting what's going to come next. We can actually use the brain to discover things like infinity, to grasp the universe, to imagine unicorns, to, to feel love, to feel jealousy, to, to actually explore and, and, and study things that are very complex, including studying the brain itself. Because the brain is the organ that is the most beautiful in the human body. But then, again, this is also the organ that makes me say that. So I don't know if I can really trust this organ. I think that what's beautiful about the brain is how complex it is, at the same time, how simple it is, and how easy it is for us to make predictions about it. And you know, there's something special about the brain. It's very, very complex, but at the same time, there's a saying among the neuroscientists, neuroscientists that if it were 
simple enough for us to understand, then we would be too simple to understand it. But still, I'm trying. Thank you very much.